This program is about unsolved mysteries. Whenever possible, the actual family members and police officials have participated in recreating the events. What you are about to see is not a news broadcast. The tiny village of Medjugorje in Yugoslavia is a mecca for countless thousands in search of physical and spiritual healing. In 1986, Jill Jensen seemed hopelessly addicted to cocaine. Rita Klaus was suffering from the debilitating effects of multiple sclerosis. Today, both of them believe that they were cured by the miracle of Medjugorje. 1974, Bullhead City, Arizona. Volunteer firefighters respond to a report of a small blaze at an abandoned miner's shack. Inside, they are stunned to find the badly burned bodies of two young boys. The deaths are ruled accidental, but since then, at least three eyewitnesses have claimed the fire was deliberately set and the boys were murdered. In Missouri, the quiet tranquility of a small town is shattered by a dramatic car chase and the shocking abduction of a popular young woman. For every mystery, there is someone, somewhere, who knows the truth. Perhaps it's you. In 1986, Chicago, Illinois, former model Jill Jensen is so strung out on cocaine, she has gouged open sores over her entire body. 500 miles away, Rita Klaus, the mother of three, attempts to overcome the painful, debilitating effects of multiple sclerosis. Rita Klaus and Jill Jensen, two women who have nothing in common, except a small village in Yugoslavia known as Medjugorje. Before civil war began to tear Yugoslavia apart, the church at Medjugorje had drawn more than 15 million pilgrims, many of them American. They came to meet six young people who call themselves visionaries. The six claimed that in 1981, they spoke to the Virgin Mary on this hill outside the village. The following description by one of the visionaries has been translated verbatim. First the light appears, then after the light Our Lady comes. She's dressed in gray with a veil. She has black hair and is supported on a cloud. Four of the young visionaries still claim to communicate with the Virgin at exactly 6.40 p.m. each day Medjugorje has become a virtual mecca for Catholic pilgrims. To accommodate the crowds, makeshift confessionals have been set up both inside and outside the church. Ten years after the original epiphany, hundreds claim they have been healed spontaneously at Medjugorje. This man, Joe Romano, swears that he was cured of abdominal cancer after he and his wife made three visits to Medjugorje. Kevin Jebel was seven years old when his parents took him on a pilgrimage to Yugoslavia. Since birth, Kevin had been plagued with digestive abnormalities, profoundly weak muscles, and an inadequate immune system. Today, at age nine, his symptoms have virtually disappeared. Char Vance's right leg was shattered in a farm accident. She says her doctors told her it was the worst break they had ever seen, but she claims her leg healed miraculously at Medjugorje. To most of us, it seems far-fetched to think that physical healing can occur simply because one travels to the scene of a religious vision. Yet for those who've watched a loved one suffer pain, which modern medicine cannot alleviate, the hope of a miracle flickers persistently, if dimly, at the back of the logical mind. 
Jill Jensen grew up in an upper middle class neighborhood outside Chicago. As a teenager, she began to experiment with drugs. Before long, she was addicted to cocaine. I don't think that many days ever went by without me using cocaine. I'd carry it in my purse, I'd conceal it in my jackets, I'd hide it in my car. I would never go anywhere without it. And um, I was unable to do anything without using the drug. I had to have it, eventually it got to the point where I had to have it to wake up, I had to have it to go to sleep, I had to have it just to function on a daily basis, just to get going, I had to smoke some. By the time Jill was 26, she had a $500 a day habit. She had tried one drug rehab center after another to no avail. Jill now smoked cocaine in freebase form because constant use had burned a hole through the lining of her nose. It got to the point where I began to hallucinate. I would start to see bugs all over me, or what I believed to be bugs. I would feel things all over me and think that I, that I had to get them off of me. No matter what I did, I just had to get these bugs off of me. So I would rip my skin open and rip out my head. And for years, I had these sores all over me. She was scrawny. She was anorexic. She had circles under her eyes. She looked far beyond her years. You know, at one time, Jill was beautiful, and all heads would turn when they saw her. And she did modeling for a while. But all that left her. In 1988, Jill's Aunt Dee Dee made a pilgrimage to Medjugorje. When she returned to the States, she tried to convince Jill to make another pilgrimage with her. A year later, Jill agreed, even though she dreaded a 14-hour plane trip without access to her precious cocaine. I didn't know how I was going to handle the withdrawals. I've been through them before. Uh, horrible headaches, sleeplessness sometimes. Uh, Terrible nightmares when I am able to sleep, cold sweats, hot flashes, um, horrible things, especially being sick. I, I didn't know how I was going to make it, but I was, I was willing to try. Something came over me that gave me the willingness to try. When Jill arrived in Medjugorje, she met with an American priest in one of the makeshift confessionals. I'm not really sure what I'm supposed to do here. You say, forgive me, Father, for I have sinned my last confession. Although nominally raised a Catholic, forgive Jill me, never had more than a passing interest in religion. My last confession was when I was eight years old. For nearly an hour, lines backed up while Jill made her confession. Next thing I know, I couldn't go anywhere without the drugs. I couldn't do anything without the drugs. And right around then, that's when that bug started. I'm really afraid of bugs and I'll do anything to get him off me. It was evident to him that I was all torn up, and I had told him what had happened and how, how I had arrived at having all these things, these sores, these open wounds. And, and when I was through with my confession, he blessed my sores with, with holy water. In nomine Patris et Filius, Spiritus Sancti, Amen. By that evening, all my sores were, were completely closing and, and healing. It was amazing. I've never, I didn't feel it happening, but every time I'd look down, I would notice that they were less and less open, the sores. And for years, they'd never, ever gone away. How are you feeling today? Within a few days, Jill's sores had almost disappeared. I can't believe how much energy I've had all day. She had yet to experience any of the symptoms of withdrawal. Her aunt had managed to arrange a meeting with one of the Medjugorje visionaries, who Jill says blessed her with a prayer to the Virgin Mary. She put her hands on both of our heads, and I felt this tremendous, like almost like electricity going through me, and this warmth. I had such a tremendous sense of well-being. It was unreal. For the first time in my life, I felt like I had been freed, that I really was going to be able to have a life, that it was given back to me. It was a gift. Three years after her trip to Medjugorje, Jill is still drug-free. 
She speaks in school drug prevention programs and works as a cosmetologist. To this day, Jill claims that she has never suffered a single symptom of withdrawal. I think it's very rare for someone who is as severe and as late stage as Jill to just be able to quit. Certainly, um, very unlikely that she could quit without experiencing some pretty severe withdrawal, both physical and psychological. I can't tell you exactly what it was that changed me completely, but I know that each and every bit of what I went through had part to do with it because I just don't have an explanation for why I was able to get a second chance at life. It must be pointed out that thousands of people, none of whom have ever heard of Medjugorje, kick drug habits each year. Yet Jill Jensen is convinced that her pilgrimage was pivotal to her recovery. Rita Klaus, suffering from an incurable disease, also believes that the Virgin of Medjugorje interceded to heal her, even though Rita never left her own home. Rita Klaus had always devoted herself to God. At the age of 15, she had entered a convent in Omaha, Nebraska. Five years later, she was diagnosed with multiple sclerosis, a degenerative, incurable disease. As her symptoms worsened, Rita felt she had no choice but to withdraw from the order. I was just heartbroken. This was my life. I had spent out uh, 13 years of my 28 years there. I loved it dearly, and I knew I wouldn't see it again. Rita moved to Pennsylvania, where she taught special education. She soon met Ron Klaus, an elementary school teacher. Three years later, they were married. Rita's MS symptoms had disappeared, and she came to believe she had been misdiagnosed. Oh, Within five years, Ron and Rita had three daughters. After the birth of the youngest, Heidi, Rita began to experience symptoms of multiple sclerosis once again. She tried to ignore them until one day the muscles in her right arm weakened uncontrollably. Thankfully, Heidi was all right. She had a, a bruise, I think she had a bruise on her shoulder and uh, one on her, her back, backside a little bit. But other than that, outside of being shaken up, she was all right. But I was not all right. I was so shaken inside uh, and so afraid, just terribly afraid. This time, Rita's symptoms did not subside. By the end of 1984, her vision was chronically blurred. Her bladder did not function properly, and she had lost virtually all feeling in her feet and lower legs. Rita was restricted to a wheelchair, and sometimes on good days, crutches. Okay. Life was uh, a challenge at this point. It was impossible to get upstairs, do the things that people take for granted. And I was a strong, independent person. I didn't want to admit that I needed help. I didn't want anyone helping me. I wanted to be the one who helped. Okay. It was hard to see her going downhill slowly at first and then at times uh, it seemed as though it was quicker and then there were times when it seemed to even off and some of the things that uh, some of the functions of her body that uh, she uh, had lost would would come back again and it was always false hope because within time that was gone again in 1986 rita heard about medjugorje and began to study the phenomenon Rita started praying to the Virgin Mary and fasted two days every week, as the young visionary said they had been told to do. Often I would look at the books about Medjugorje and I would think I would love to be there. And then I would look at myself and say, but physically there's no way I could go. Financially there's no way I could go. And so I didn't go. Rita's prayers were always on behalf of others. Then one night she claims she heard a voice. Why don't you ask? Why don't you ask? Dear Mary, my mother, Queen of Peace, whom I know is appearing to the children at Medjugorje, please ask your son to heal me in any way I need to be healed. As soon as I finished the prayer, 
I felt this feeling through my body like electricity, but it was especially intense on the right side of my body where I had deformities in the right leg and uh, I dropped ankles and so on. And uh, I thought this isn't happening to me and I fell asleep. The next morning, Rita had no memory of the voice or the prayer. At the time, she was taking a class at the local college and Ron helped her into her specially rigged automobile as he always did. Midway through the class, I felt this rush of heat through my body. And by the end of class, I could feel, I could feel there were wrinkles inside my shoes. I could move my toes. Uh, I had not been able to move my toes for years. Uh, I was dumbfounded. I remembered nothing from the night before, but I knew something was happening. I could feel that my legs were seemed to be strong. I could lift them by myself. I got myself out of the car with no problem. Rita rushed home to tell her family She had not walked on her own without help for more than four years. As I stood there looking at the steps, I had a flashback. And in that flashback, I heard the voice from the night before, the prayer that was given me to say. And I knew I was completely healed. I ran all the way up the steps. I remember I was screaming at the top of the steps. And then I ran down the steps, out the front door. I was screaming at the sky, oh, thank you, God, oh, thank you, blessed mother. Look, I can walk. You're really thinking that you're not seeing what you're actually seeing. You want to be happy, but you're almost afraid to be happy. Because every doctor that you've ever seen has said it's, it would never happen. See how that feels. Okay. Six months went by. Rita's symptoms did not return. After 15 agonizing years, she was at last able to function normally. Rita and Ron believed that she was healed by a miracle of faith. For this to clear instantly. Dr. Richard Kasdorf is an expert in so-called spontaneous healings. In the realm of medical practice. Uh, this certainly could be called a miraculous event, if you want to use that term, because we just don't see uh, 20 years of disability clear instantly. That's so good. It's exciting, isn't it beautiful? It's great. It has now been six years since Rita threw away her crutches. <laughs> she has never felt another symptom of multiple sclerosis. Yeah, I'm, I'm hanging in there. Is Rita Klaus's cure a miracle that can be ascribed to the Virgin at Medjugorje? The Catholic Church is publicly skeptical, but continues to investigate. On the other hand, Webster's Dictionary defines a miracle not only in standard religious terms, but also simply as a wonderful thing. By this definition, Jill Jensen drug-free and Rita Klaus ice skating are miracles even non-believers can celebrate. Bullhead City, Arizona is a small, quiet community nestled along the banks of the Colorado River. Sue Johnson moved there from California in 1973. She and her husband felt it was an ideal place to raise their children, eight-year-old Angel and seven-year-old Scott. Can I go out and play? Did you do your chores? Yes, ma'am. Did you take out the trash? Yes, They loved it. Uh, Scott was a natural-born fisherman. He loved to fish and go out in the desert, catch lizards, catch a snake, whatever. He was just, he, he was a desert rat. He just fell in love with it. <laughs> 50 yards from the Johnson's new home stood an abandoned shack, a powder magazine once used by copper miners to store supplies. Scott and his friends soon adopted the rundown shed as their headquarters. Got you. Oh, they just played there and played cops and robbers and Indians and cowboys and whatever else little boys do. I never felt any apprehension towards that building at all. And it was within sight of the house. It wasn't anything to worry about. It was a typical thing that children would pick to use 
for a fort or a clubhouse. At 3.45 p.m. on April 3, 1974, the Bullhead City Volunteer Fire Department responded to a call. The shack was on fire. Eighteen years later, former Fire Chief Larry Adams vividly remembers the details. All right, open it up. What I could see through the smoke and the steam is what appeared to be upholstery uh, on the floor. The pike pole. When I got the pike pole, uh, I stooped down to look under the smoke to hook this material and drag it out to extinguish it. Inside the shack lay the badly burned bodies of Scott Johnson and one of his friends. Seven weeks later, the official coroner's report was released. It stated that Scott Johnson and his friend had died accidentally. Investigators concluded that the boys had probably been playing with matches and gasoline. I was shocked. I was very shocked. My child was certainly smarter than to just lay in the back of a building and wait to be asphyxiated by smoke or burned by fire. Uh, it's kind of an obvious thing. I always knew it was a murder, always. Sue Johnson was not alone in her opinions. From the onset, Larry Adams also believed that Scott and his friend were victims of foul play. In particular, he noticed that the door of the shack had not been locked or obstructed in any way. All anybody had to do to escape that building was push on the door. In this case, in building six by six, uh, in that panic situation, they would hit that door and escape the building, had they been able to. A few feet from the door, Adams found a two by 12 inch wooden plank. Curiously, the board had a circle burned into one side. It indicated to me that somebody had prevented their escape through that door. They may have initially uh, tried to hold the door, uh, but it's metal, it got hot, they can't hold the door any longer. They need something uh, to insulate them from the heat. They picked up the tube of 12, one on each end or more and held the tube of 12 uh, against the door with, with one person on each end of it. Angel, dinner. Despite Larry Adams' findings, the police closed their criminal investigation. As the weeks went by, Sue Johnson was haunted by the burned out shack where her son died, where she believed her son had been murdered for four long years, she struggled in vain to have the case reopened. Then in 1978, a convicted felon came forward with shocking new information. Dale Gordon Meter was incarcerated at a county jail in New Mexico. At the time of the fire, he lived in Bullhead City. Anytime you talk to a prisoner that wants to give you information, you know he's trying to cut himself a deal. The man just did not seem like he was, you know, really telling us all the truth. There was, you know, there's knowledge there. I was parked about, say, 50, 75 yards away from the powder magazine, and seeing these two guys holding... The meter advised us that he saw two men holding these two young kids and pushing them in the powder magazine. One of the kids looked like he was heavily drugged, and the other one was fighting. And then he saw one of the men with a gas can. Did you actually see him take the gas can into the shack? I didn't see him throw any gas into the shack. After about five or 10 minutes, I noticed both dogs standing out front right next to the house, and I heard whining coming from one of the two kids.
What do you want? They said that they was afraid the kids was gonna tell on them for smoking pot. And then I saw flames and smoke coming out of the magazine, and I said, hey man, I just wanna know what's going on. You do what you gotta do, catch her there. Just take a walk. One of them told him in street terms to get lost, and we just burned up two kids. Have you seen either one of these men since that time? Meter told investigators that he encountered one of the men while serving time at a prison in Nevada two years after the fire. Sheriff's deputies questioned the man Meter identified as the killer of Scott Johnson and his friend, but no charges were ever filed. It was just an open and closed case, and that's not really what happened. Tina you know, Remo uh, and John Cadence reported the fire on the day Scott Johnson and his friend and died. And I wish that I could do they more. They too were convinced but the I, boys uh, were murdered. I can't. At the time, Tina and John were teenagers. Their eyewitness accounts seemed to corroborate Dale Meter's chilling version of events. There was two men. One was standing on the side of the hill facing the door of the shack. And the other one, well, he didn't like this, the idea that we were there. And he took off and went running. The other man was standing there, and he looked over at John and I. He just stayed there. That was what was so eerie. He, he just stared at us like, well, what are you going to do, you know? Oh, and that's when I said, you know, to Tina, I said, I think we should go call the fire department on this. You know, because I think them guys set this place on fire. You know, and that's when we left. John and Tina told investigators about the two men they had seen. However, they believe their statements were ignored due to their own previous scrapes with the law. It didn't seem like they took it seriously at all. You know, it seemed like they didn't believe my story and, you know, from my past reputation. You know, they it seemed to me like they just disregarded it and, and I never heard nothing no more about it. With the passage of time, the tragedy slowly faded from public memory. A number of the original investigators retired or moved away, but Sue Johnson continued her relentless quest for the truth. You wonder, was there someone who wanted this just tucked away quickly and for good? Or was it just sloppy investigation or just circumstances? I honestly feel that it was a combination of a lot of things. I've talked with Sue on the phone and in person many times. In 1989, and newly appointed chief of detectives, she understands Leo how I feel, ordered the case reopened that I as a have murder investigation. Torture, and I understand how she feels. And I've, I told her in the beginning, when I, I started out, that there may not be an answer to this, but we're gonna keep looking. Were Scott Johnson and his friends savagely murdered? If so, why would someone kill two young boys who were not yet 10 years old? The answers to these haunting questions may lie in a surprising discovery Scott made near the shack three weeks before he died. Look at what I found! What is it? The $100 bill! I think that it's possible it. that there could have been someone yeah, let's take it that to our home. used that area possibly for a drug transaction or something. And maybe the people that they saw doing this um, thought that the kids would run a block away to the sheriff's substation and report them and therefore they felt like they had to do something to stop it. If we, if we could establish a motive, a reason that these boys were killed, it certainly would help the case. But uh, the motive is, is strictly a matter of speculation on anybody's part as far as, as far as I know. It's very hard to live every day of your life and wonder why your son was murdered and why no one's ever done anything about it in all these many years. I hope that whoever did it gets to pay for what they did someday. I don't care how long it takes. I've been patient this long. I can wait longer if that's what it takes. 
Even in her victory to have the investigation reopened, Sue Johnson has met with defeat. Many of the case files and much of the physical evidence has been misplaced or long since discarded. Detectives have little to go on, save the faint hope that a new eyewitness will come forward. Next, a young woman is apparently abducted and her family fears for her life. Clinton, Missouri, population 9,000, is an idyllic farming community in the heart of small town America. The type of place where everyone knows each other and feels insulated from big city crime. But today, a cloud of uncertainty hovers over Clinton. A popular young woman has been abducted and quite possibly murdered. Angela Hammond was an active, outgoing 20-year-old, known to everyone as Angie. Her family had lived in Clinton for three generations. Her fiancé, Rob Schaefer, was a star athlete in high school who looked forward to a career in the military. In January of 1991, Rob gave Angie a diamond ring and promised that he would always take care of her. I'm gonna go see Kyla now, so I'll give you a call later, okay? April 4th, 1991. At around 10 p.m., Angie dropped Rob off at his house after a barbecue. She promised that she would phone him a few hours later. That was about 10 o'clock. I was gonna meet her back uptown as soon as my mom got home. I was watching my little brother at the time. Uh, and she called later on that night. Hello? Hi, Rob. It's Angie. Hi. At 1115, Angie called Rob from a payphone in the center of town, approximately seven blocks from his house. Square. While we were talking on the phone, she mentioned to me about a truck circling around the block, an older model green Ford pickup truck. Pickup truck that keeps circling around the block. Do you recognize the truck? No. He's probably not from around here. Maybe he's just lost. I guess so. Anyway, do you still want to go to the lake this week? Angie remained unconcerned until the truck parked next to the phone booth. Uh, Rob, he's pulling up next to the phones. What's the driver look like? He's kind of dirty looking. He's got a mustache, beard, and glasses, and he's wearing overalls. And he's coming to the phones. The truck is a late model green pickup truck with uh, one of those decals that cover the whole back window. It uh, looks, looks like a leg scene with a fish jumping out of water. What's he doing now, Angie? He used the phone next to her, got back in his truck, and looked at something with a flashlight. She described the flashlight to me on the phone. He was looking for something. I, I had her turn around and ask him if he needed to use the phone. Maybe the other phone was Excuse broke. Me? And he you said, no, he was just going to try again in a minute. No. Maybe I should come down there. Oh, Rob, no, I'm sure it's OK. Um, so anyway, um, and we just talked about other things. We weren't too worried about it. And that's when I heard her scream on the phone. When I heard her scream, the only thing that went through my mind is getting up there and finding out what the hell's going on. I ran out of the house, just dropped the phone. I didn't even hang the phone back up. Uh, and just headed out there. I saw a pickup truck going past me. And then somebody yelled out the window, Robbie. That's how I knew it was then. Angie! Pursued the pickup straight through the downtown business district. He had no idea that when he threw his car into reverse, he had severely damaged the transmission. When the pickup made a sharp right turn, Rob's car finally gave out. I chased him about two miles. The transmission failed. It uh. It started dying as I was making my turn to the right. Uh, this guy turned off the right. All I saw was his brake lights and dust. Mm. 
Ma blamed himself for it because he, he always told her he'd be there to take care of her. And he tried, he did everything that could be done. You know, nobody blames him, but I think he thinks that people blame him. The beginning is the hardest because you know you were close enough to get them, but she just didn't get the job done. And you still wake up at night nice wondering where she's at, wondering what happened, wondering if anybody's still looking. You just wonder all the time. The news of Angie's disappearance sent shockwaves through Clinton. The police and hundreds of citizens launched an extensive air and land search, but there was no sign of Angela Hammond, her abductor, or the pickup truck. We uh, had some assistance from the Missouri State Highway Patrol that did a computer search on all registered vehicles with make in, in the approximate year. Uh, to their help, and we had like 1,600 possibilities uh, that we had to look, look after. Uh, checking wherever these trucks are at on as far as color and, and if they had any mural uh, in the back window uh, with no success. The police based their investigation on Rob Schaefer's testimony, but when no witnesses could be found to corroborate his statement, Rob became a suspect himself. I think, you know, it was natural that people wondered, you know, did the boyfriend do it type thing. But my feeling, I've known the kid all his life, and um, I, I never doubted for a minute that he had anything to do with it. Within a week, Rob Schaefer was cleared of any involvement in Angie's disappearance. Two days later, the police connected the abduction in Clinton to two other unsolved cases within a 100-mile radius. The first occurred near Max Creek, Missouri, on January 19, 1991. Up, but there's a man that's been hanging around outside for a while now, and I'm really starting to get nervous. Forty-two-year-old Trudy Darby was working alone in a convenience store. Around 10 p.m., she called her son to report a suspicious man lurking outside. Less than 10 minutes later, Trudy's son arrived at the store and found it completely deserted. Two days later, the body of Trudy Darby was found on a riverbank, 10 miles from the store. She had been shot twice in the head. Then on February 28th, 30-year-old Cheryl Ann Kenny was reported missing in Nevada, Missouri, 70 miles from Max Creek. She vanished shortly after closing up the convenience store where she worked. That night, Cheryl's car was found in the store parking lot. She has not been seen since. Less than one month later, Angela Hammond would be abducted. If uh, Angela's found, it uh, might provide that link if they are related to, uh, for example, Trudy Darby. Uh, or if Cheryl's found, it, maybe that'd be a connection uh, to Trudy Darby, how she was murdered. Authorities now fear that a serial killer may be on the loose in West Central Missouri. Even though they hold out little hope that either Cheryl Ann Kenny or Angela Hammond are still alive, there have been unconfirmed sightings of Angela in several states and most recently Canada. If anybody out there sees anything, you know, um, if they could put themselves in our place and know how we feel, you know, how heart-wrenching it is that she was taken, um, even if the guy that took her sees this, if he would just call and let him know what he did with her. There's one final chilling detail, the abduction of Angela Hammond. After she screamed into the phone, Rob Schaefer heard another person speak, most likely her abductor. All he said was, I didn't need to use the phone anyway. Before she disappeared, Angie described the suspect as a filthy, bearded man who wore glasses and was dressed in overalls. The suspect was driving a late 1960s, early 1970s, two-tone green Ford pickup truck. The back window was completely covered by an opaque decal of a fish jumping out of water, which may look like this.
When we return, a bank fraud investigator disappears in the Arizona desert. May 5th, 1990, 7 a.m. In the middle of the desolate Arizona desert, 100 miles southeast of Phoenix, a crime is committed, far from the eyes of potential witnesses. Less than half an hour later, a deputy sheriff finds the burning car. Authorities believe the arsonist was covering up a bigger crime, murder. The car was burned to the ground, and the fact is that uh, had there been any evidence in the car, such as blood, uh, we weren't able to tell because of the, the burning. The car's owner was 56-year-old Lee Young, a bank fraud investigator from Scottsdale, Arizona. He was nowhere to be found. When they gave me the information the car was burned and Lee wasn't there, then my wildest fears just became a reality. That, because you live with that every day that something could happen, but you just don't really believe it ever will. Police feared the worst, that Lee Young had been murdered. The most obvious motive, robbery. Young always wore a distinctive $25,000 Rolex watch and carried large amounts of cash so he could buy jewelry, which he sold in his spare time. When police searched the car, they were surprised to find thousands of dollars worth of jewelry still in the trunk. Young's family suspected a scenario far more sinister than simple robbery. The only thing missing out of that trunk of that car that I am aware of is the briefcase that carried his files. So that makes me believe that it wasn't robbery motive, it was job-related, case-related of some sort. Several months before he disappeared, Lee Young had contacted federal agents who dealt with drug smuggling. Young suspected that his bank was being used by a money laundering ring. During the week before he disappeared, Young tried to reach the agents a number of times without success. From South America. Through New we York, uh, was involved in one particular case investigating a uh, major drug cartel in Colombia. And uh, he had been involved in this investigation within six months prior to his disappearance. And the case was still ongoing, as a matter of fact, at the time of his disappearance. On May 4th, 1990, Lee Young left a restaurant in Scottsdale around 12.30 p.m. He was never seen again. That afternoon, a single call came in over his car phone, and three calls went out, one to a phone booth, and the others to a woman who denied ever having talked to Lee Young on the telephone. I don't know for a fact that Lee made these calls. In fact, uh, it's possible that uh, Lee was taken down prior to 2 o'clock Friday afternoon, and that uh, the three calls made after 2 o'clock were made by uh, somebody else. Lee Young's family believes that he was kidnapped by someone who wanted to destroy his bank fraud investigation records. They think that person, not Lee Young, made the phone calls. Everything points to the fact that Lee's not alive. And my heart still says he's out there somewhere. But logic tells me he's not. What happened to Lee Young? Was he killed in a robbery attempt? Or did he inadvertently become the victim of one of his own bank fraud investigations? Connie Young clings to the slim hope that someone saw her husband's plum-colored 1985 Lincoln Town Car. Between the time he left the restaurant on May 4th, 1990, and the time the car was found in flames the next day, she also hoped someone might have information about his copper-faced Rolex watch which has diamonds encircling the face and studying the band. On May 5th, 
on our next Unsolved Mysteries. For years, legendary tales have circulated about the abominable snowman, a frightening human-like creature said to roam the high plateaus of the Himalayas. But for the natives of this isolated land, the snowman is all too real. A half-man, half-ape known as Yeti. Is he a mythological monster or a distant relative of man? Join us next time for another edition of Unsolved Mysteries. Thank you.